The first quarter of the NFL season is in the books. Chris Bosh throws a parting shot at the Miami Heat. Is Tebow really making a comeback? Of course, we have the New York Sports Report, and stick around to hear who's on the bench this week. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 411 Sports? I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. And I'm Vincent Davis. And without any further ado, Mike, won't you get us started with what's popping? That's right, Keisha. Let's get to an NFL recap real quick, you know, with NFL Week 4 in the books. Hey, how's uh, Bill Belichick looking this weekend? Well, not so good after he got outcoached by Rex Ryan and the Bills. But the big story that we'll start with is Dak Prescott, who has certainly exceeded expectations in Big D. The former fourth-round pick from last year's draft is looking sensational with the Cowboys. So far, Keisha, I'll start with you. Is it safe to say that this is Prescott's team right now and not Tony Romo's? I think we got to pump the brakes a little bit on the talk about Prescott taking over the Dallas Cowboys. He's been impressive for the first four weeks. He's had zero turnovers, uh, zero including fumbles and interceptions, and he's got a 98.5 passer rating. But he got these wins with some... Mediocre to subpar talent, the Redskins, the Bears, and the 49ers. So we'll see how he is when he's going against some stiffer competition. The Bengals are on the schedule, the Packers, the Steelers are coming up, the Eagles. So we'll see. But the, one of the main reasons why this will not be Prescott's team is because Tony Romo is owner Jerry Jones's guy. Jerry Jones has always always operated under the motto, in Romo we trust. And he has gone on record saying that with Tony Romo at the helm, that team has a better chance of winning. So whenever Tony Romo is ready, if he's ready this season, it's going to be his team. Unless, I don't know, unless Prescott's just doing really well, but I, I just believe that Jerry Jones, Tony Romo, that's a match made in heaven. Jerry Jones is that ride or die chick you hear about in a rap song, so... I think that it's it's going to be Romo's team when he's ready. Yeah, and why does it have to be anybody's team right now? The, the point is, your main quarterback is out, this guy filled in, and they're winning. First of all, it, it's really important that you do beat the team that you should beat. And this is all happening now. So I think, like Keisha says, we should pump the brakes a little bit before we start deciding whose team um, the Cowboys is. Yeah, I think that Tony Romo is so injury prone that even when he does come back, I think that people are going to be walking on eggshells, nervous that he might wind up getting injured again. But Keisha, as you pointed out, Jerry Jones, and this has been coming up on a decade now that Romo has been this franchise quarterback with Dallas, he's got a lot of faith in this guy, and he thinks that that window of opportunity to go ahead and win a Super Bowl, it's closing, but they still have an opportunity. And with a 3-1 and one start with Dak Prescott, and things are looking good. I think there's a sense of optimism in Dallas, but I think, as you guys both point out, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's find out when Tony Romo will return first before we start questioning whose team it actually really is. We're going to stay on the gridiron and we're going to go to the A, Atlanta that is, and I think it's about time we might need to start paying a little more attention to Atlanta Falcons. Falcons wide receiver Julio Jones had the league's first 300 yard catching, I'm sorry, receiving game in three years. And the Falcons seem to have a stronghold on the NFC South after an impressive 48-33 win against the Carolina Panthers. Panthers quarterback Cam Newton was on the end of a nasty hit, and he's now in concussion protocol. What do you guys think about the Falcons, and how seriously should we take them? I think we should take them very seriously. We're going to find out a lot about the Falcons this weekend. They go to Denver. They play a big game against the Broncos, which is not going to be easy. But I think for the for the Falcons, with a 3-1 and one start where everyone else in your division, the three other teams have had lackluster performances to start off the season, I think Atlanta should be feeling really good and positive about themselves. The way that they've started off this season, they've had some very good wins. They crushed Carolina on Sunday. I know the Panthers wound up getting back into that game, but let's face it, Julio Jones was sensational. And I think the Falcons, they, they, they should have some optimism going into the rest of the season. Well, the Falcons is your team because you you know you keep talking about the Falcons. They're 3-1 and one in a division that everybody else is 1-3. The teams that they've beaten, Carolina, Green Bay, and the Giants all have top-tier quarterbacks. So um, they are a team that needs to be, that could be reckoned with. I think that we should pay attention but have a little bit of a caveat because as high-powered of an offense they have, their defense is weak. They're ranked 30th overall and 31st against the pass. And Vincent mentioned in that game, 
they allowed Carolina to score three touchdowns in the fourth quarter to bring them within striking distance. So as great as they are on offense, that's how weak they are on defense. And Carolina's defense needs to be really addressed. And I think they might be kicking themselves for letting Josh Norman go. They should just throw money at that problem. And because they had two, rick- two rookies covering Julio Jones in single coverage, you, you can't do that. I mean, Josh Norman probably would have had fits on his own, and he's experienced trying to do a uh, cover Josh, um, I'm sorry, Julio Jones one-on-one. But th- the Panthers' defense is not what we thought they were. So, But Atlanta is now on the radar. Well, guys, let's get to the NBA real quick. We touched on it a little bit last week with Chris Bosh and the Pat Riley Miami situation, but really the story in South Florida last week was that, of course, the Miami Heat and Pat Riley announced that they would be cutting ties with Chris Bosh. And uh, over the weekend, Chris Bosh really went off on a little bit of a tirade in, in a video segment where he lashed out at the Miami Heat for unleashing some of the secrets that were involved with his medical situation. And on top of that, what ba- what Bosh did was he vowed that he would return to the NBA. I asked both of you, is there a likelihood that Bosh can return to the NBA? And if so, Vincent, I'll start with you. What are some of the teams that would be good choices? None of the teams would really be good choices. This reminds me of the Rocky movie when uh, Apollo Creed was fighting uh, Yvonne Drago, and and he's he's about to get killed. And he says he looks at Rocky and he says, "Don't stop this fight, no matter what." He, um, Chris Bosh, has to remember two names: Hank Gavis, one who died playing college basketball on a televised tournament game on a Sunday afternoon. He died from a, uh, a, a heart problem. And also Reginald Lewis, who died four, four years later um, in practice. He was practicing uh, off-season for the Boston Celtics, and he died. Three months before he passed out and died the last time, he had also passed out during a game, during a playoff game. Hank Gavis, three months before he died, he had also passed out. In front, in um, during a game, and and Chris and Chris Bosh, he needs to take this into consideration. If he has, a, he's having these problems. He, he he needs to really understand that these are serious problems, and that uh, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a cure. No, no, they with all the money that they have and all the resources that they have, no one's come come up with a magic, excuse me, a magic elixir saying you drink this, you take this, and you're going to be fine. He, he's, he's due a lot of money over the next few years. He's made a lot of money over the last past years. He should just take his money, be happy. If I was a team, I would not touch Chris Bosh with a 10-foot pole. Because I would not want to be the, the team that has his contract in hand. If, God forbid, something happens to him, either on the court or traveling to a basketball event, this is the time where the owners need to make the decision for him and let Chris Bosh go into retirement he'll go kicking and screaming but he'll be forced to a new reality because he's been diagnosed with blood clots multiple times and he says he's fine but he yet he still failed the physical so there's something wrong there's there's something there and i i just hope that he will come to terms with it if not that the decision's made for him and you know something what's so ironic about this is eric spolstro the head coach for the miami heat bosch's coach was on the court actually the day that Hank Gathers died. He was feet, he was he played on the opposing team as a guard, and he was feet a few yards away from him as he passed out and as he took his last breath out there on the court. Yeah, I agree with both of you guys. I, I'm not going to reiterate what both of you had spoke about because I think the big thing for me, one of the things that's got to be pushing Bosch is he's got almost borderline Hall of Fame credentials. I think he is a Hall of Famer, 11-time All-Star, 2-time NBA champion, but I think one of the things that might be pushing him to return on the court, of course, he's a competitor, but I think also is he's a guy that might be saying maybe there's some people out there that might not think I'm exactly a Hall of Famer. If I can go out and play another two, three years, I can really prove myself. I'll end with this. The big thing that wor- that bothered me about the story was the fact that Chris Bosch found out through the media. Couldn't Pat Riley have just given him a phone call or a text message <laughs> or something? Did he really have to find out by watching ESPN like everybody else? I think that Miami owed it to him to at least let him know what was going on. Pat Riley's getting some reputation over the last few months between that and uh, Dwayne Wade. But in Miami Heat's defense, this, their spokesperson said that they did reach out to Chris Bosch and his agent via phone calls, text messages, and, and emails, and they never got back yeah. to him. So um, it's a he said, she said. That's true. But we just, in the end, wish that 
Chris Bosch lives a long, healthy, happy life. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. So we don't get a chance to talk about everything. So now here's a couple quick bites for you to chew on. Tebow Mania is back. NFL, former NFL quarterback Tim Tebow made his professional baseball debut in the Mets Instructional League. And what did he do in his first so bat? at that? He cracks a home run. Now, can he keep this up? Time will tell. It has been reported that number one overall NBA draft pick and Philadelphia 76ers rookie Ben Simmons will be sidelined for approximately three months after having surgery to repair a broken bone in his right foot. We wish him a healthy recovery. And Houston Texans defensive end J.J. Watt will miss the rest of the season after undergoing back surgery, his second within three months. We also wish him a full, healthy recovery. And Cleveland Browns wide receiver Josh Brown has checked himself into an inpatient rehab facility for alcohol abuse. Gordon served four-game suspension for violation of the NFL drug policy, and it was rumored that the Cleveland Browns were going to shop him a few weeks ago. But with this recent development, it has been decided uh, via coach Hugh Jackson that they were done with Gordon for good. We'll keep it right here because coming up, we get to the good, the bad, and the ugly in our New York sports report. We're talking Giants, Jets, Mets, and of course, the Brooklyn Nets and New York Knickerbockers. Keep it here. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. And now, here's our New York sports report. That's right, Keisha. We're going to start with your favorite baseball team, the New York Mets, and I'll start with you. They earned a wild card matchup against the San Francisco Giants, but I ask you, Keisha, what things could the Mets have done differently throughout this season to possibly have gained, uh, have been able to go out and win the NL East as opposed to getting in through the wild card? Could they have done some things differently? Well, I think the biggest thing that affected the Mets was something that was out of their control, which was injuries. Their pitching was rocked with injuries. We lost Matt Harvey. Jacob DeGrom was in and out of the lineup. Noah Syndergaard was out of the lineup. Steven Metz in and out of the lineup. And, I mean, that's just the pitching. There was uh, David Wright, Johanna Cespedes, and some. the list goes on. So you can't really prepare for that. I don't know if it's just luck or I don't know what their strength and conditioning program is like. So I don't know if maybe there's some fine tuning there. So I think in that regard, you can't do anything. The only thing you can do is is coach up, coach the next person up. And then I don't know, maybe it's time in the off season to, to do some training because at times the batting seemed to be a little sluggish. So I don't know if that's something that they will address in the off season. Oh, Keisha says luck. It should be prefaced with bad luck. Um, I mean, sometimes things happen. They just... Um, came, they just was inundated with injury after injury. Only thing they could have done is not play that that, that guy on that day. Um, the Mets have done really good um, for where they've gotten to this season, and we just have to you just have to be grateful for for a Mets fan would just have to be grateful for what they have. I think the Mets overachieved. They had all these injuries that they had to deal with. I think it was pretty much obvious that the Washington Nationals were going to wind up winning the AL East about a month or two into the season. But the Mets held on. Okay, they earned a wild card spot. And and the injuries, as you pointed out, both of you pointed out, those things are sometimes out of your control. The Mets did what they did. They got Jay Bruce before the trading deadline. Uh, they went ahead. I think that was actually after the trading deadline when they picked up Jay Bruce. But they made some right moves. They made some good decisions. I think that they should be happy about the fact that they overachieved and actually got into the playoff. So we move from one team that's in the playoffs to a team that we hope, at least I hope and Mike hopes, will make the playoffs, and that's the New York Giants. Odell Beckham Jr. is here a distraction for the team. During a recent matchup against Washington, Odell Beckham Jr. was visibly frustrated on the sidelines. And in this day and age where social media practically rules everything, people weighed in with their opinions, their clever memes, and videos. And one of the voices that rang out was, and probably the most important voice, was that of New York Giants head coach Ben McAdoo, who says that he wants Odell to be less of a distraction for the team and so that they can center on winning games. 
Mike, since you're the other resident Giants fan here, I'll pass it off to you. What do you think about Odell Beckham Jr. and whether or not he's a distraction? Is he hampering the team in any way? And can he be on his way to becoming another Terrell Owens, as some people may have argued? I don't think he'll wind up being a Terrell Owens the way that a lot of people are thinking that that could turn out. Look, I mean, I'll start with this. The Giants have a lot of question marks as they as they head into the rest of the season after playing four games. We saw them earlier in the week lose to the Minnesota Vikings. They were exposed in a lot of ways. I think the big thing with Odell Beckham, he's got to control the way that he handles himself on the sidelines. These temper tantrums that he's been engaging in with himself, not really getting into it with, with teammates. It's, it's all on him, right? It's not like he's yelling at players. I mean, he'll do it sometimes to motivate some of his teammates, but it's all internal, I feel like. I think as soon as he kind of kind of tones his act down, things will start to improve. But the thing I'll finish with Odell Beckham, it seems to me like cornerbacks and, and, and defensive players find an easy way to get into this guy's head. Not late in the game, but immediately. The first thing these guys try to do is taunt him, say things, mean things, whatever it is. And it seems that it's from that point forward, even if he's making catches, even if he's making big, big, um, having an influence on the game, it still seems like he's a distraction because what's going on is he goes onto the sidelines and really kind of sometimes he acts like a jerk. All right, let me say this. In defense of Terrell Owens, Terrell Owens was a great player. He was a great, he was a really good player. He, he only became somewhat of a distraction because um, he wasn't winning. And, and he didn't feel that the players that were on his team, except when he got later on in the years, especially like in the Eagles, they, they were given their all. Now, rego- now regarding um, uh, uh, Beckham, you're absolutely right. These guys are getting into his head. The, the, the cornerbacks, the other defensive and the defensive players are getting into his head. No matter, they're, they're saying things to him, and, and, and he, just, he can't deal with it. And he wants to prove to them that he's, whatever they're saying, he wants to prove that, He's not that, or that he's 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 manly, or that he's trying to man up. But if he's not getting passes from uh, um, from Eli. from Eli, he can't do that. Like the other night, uh, he's only had he only got about three passes, twenty something yards. So um, he can't he, he can't prove himself. But he's got to realize that what he's what he's doing is he's drawing attention to himself from the other players. By drawing attention to himself from the other players, that's opening up other people on the field, giving them opportunity to score, giving their run game an opportunity to uh, proceed. And he's, he's got to remember that. And he's, it, the way he's doing it now, it's become about him, about what he, I mean, about his catches, how many yards he's receiving. And he's got to get that out of his mind and become more of a team player. Whew. Well, I mean, there's some, my mind, I have so much to say, and I'm going to try to Get it all in. Um, I'm going to touch on Vincent's point about the comparison between Beckham and uh, Terrell Owens in the sense that I think they're kind of one in the same in that they want to win so badly and it frustrates them when they don't. And I feel as though Odell may think that some of his teammates don't have that same passion to win because if you notice, there's not a lot of body language, not a lot of like pride or or something seems to be missing internally with a lot of these players and I think he feels it and he's trying to maybe pull it out of them and it's not working he's not getting the ball they're losing games that they should have won in when they faced Washington and I think they actually had a pretty good chance to pull out a victory here at um not here in Minnesota when they played the Vikings so I mean you've got all of that yes he's young and he does need to um, mature and really understand that this is a mental game and these defense the, the word is out the defense quarterbacks cornerbacks know how to get under his skin and they're going to do it and he needs to know that it's coming and how to prepare for it the best revenge is to catch the ball and run he's got to get it Eli but um, you know I just hope that for, as a Giants fan as a Beckham Jr. fan, I hope that he does really take some time, but I'm kind of hesitant because of the comments that he made after the game about the refs are after him, and it's just not good. I I don't think he's hampering the team, and I don't think he's that much of a distraction. There are so many other areas of improvement that the Giants need in order to win. He's a passionate competitor, but he's letting the, he's letting the aggressive defenders get the best of him. 
The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Now we're going to go to the team that shares MetLife Stadium with the New York Giants, and that's the New York Jets. The Jets have got problems. They have a banged up wide receiving core with Brandon Marshall nursing foot and knee ailments. Eric Decker is out with a partially torn rotator cuff. And um, rookie Jalen Marshall is out of action for a few weeks as well. If that's not bad enough, even if they were healthy, who knows if they would actually get the ball because Ryan Fitzpatrick in two games has nine interceptions. I'll open the floor to you guys and let me know what do you think about the state of the Jets? Is Ryan Fitzpatrick the reason for the woes? And should Geno Smith just take over? Vincent, <laughs> you look like you're ready to go. <laughs> I mean, this, this is interesting because um, for the last game, you really can't blame Ryan Fitzpatrick for um, all the Jets' problems. Up until the third quarter, they were into the game. They had an opportunity to win. Um, Seattle co just completely shut them down. If I'm not mistaken, the score was 13-10 to 10 or 17-10. to 10. Um, Seattle just completely shut them down towards the end of the third quarter and completely in the fourth quarter, um, squelching any opportunities that they had. Um, Jets defense. Jets defense didn't stop. Uh, Seattle. You can't blame Ryan Fitzpatrick for that. Uh, the week before, Coach Bowles was out of his mind. He left. The, he left the game into the press conference, and he was cursing. He was bleep this, bleep that. Game? That was six interceptions. Bleep this, bleep that. So um, the Jets. The Jets do have a problem. He believes that they can turn it around. He believes, he still believes in Ryan Fitzpatrick. That's what he says. That's what he said in the press conference the other night. And the team, all the players, um, consistently said that they believe in um, Ryan Fitzpatrick. But one of the interesting notes is, before, after the game on Sunday, after Bowles' press conference and after Ryan Fitzpatrick's press conference, I was leaving the press conference to go to the Jets locker room, and I passed Geno Smith, dressed, ready to go, at the door. All right, and the press conferences didn't could have lasted. Each press conference together jointly couldn't have lasted no more than 15 minutes, if I'm exaggerating in time. But Gino was ready to go. Well, guys, we go back to the NBA. The buzz is really back now uh, in Brooklyn as the Nets have Jeremy Lin and things are trying to turn around from last season. But of course, the Knicks with the new look with the new look Knicks and everything. But I want to ask you guys about Joachim Noah, who skipped the team military dinner last week. Uh, basically, he was doing this as a boycott because he's someone who's anti-violence and anti-war. Vincent, what was your take? Were these was this move justified by Noah, or did you think that it was inappropriate? I'm not saying it's inappropriate, but I think that he could have eaten dinner with the with the uh, the cadets. I, they, there was no reason why he couldn't just sit down, talk to them, try to get their understanding, their feeling of um, you know what their thought patterns are, what you know their interest in going to a school like uh, West Point, their interest, their thoughts about um, the military, and just have a regular conversation. Well, you know, I've personally been on this show applauding Colin Kaepernick for standing up for what his beliefs are and defending his right to do so. So I can't in good conscience criticize Joe Kim Noah for standing up for his beliefs. He's always been anti-war, pro-peace from what I've understood, from what I understand. So he's been consistent in that. So, um... I think maybe the only thing that might be considered inappropriate is that he shunned dinner with the host. But he did spend time with the cadets uh, either the day before or over the course of the time that they've been at West Point, talking with the cadets, showing respect and for what they do, their decision to do it. And I, I think that it shouldn't be made a big deal. Well, if you watch this program regularly like most of our viewers do, you know that each week there's a reason to bench someone. Sit them down. Find out who gets benched this week. Who sits when we return? Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. For those of you who don't know, each week we put people who are behaving badly on the bench. And if they're really misbehaving, they get in that doghouse. This week, all of us are putting someone on the bench. Mike, I'm going to start with you. Who is going on the bench? 
Keisha, I'm putting Dallas Cowboys defensive end Randy Gregory on the bench. Randy Gregory violated the NFL substance abuse policy and wound up failing a drug test back in July. While he was already serving a four-game suspension, but now that the results have been released from this failed drug test, he's going to have to serve his suspension through week 14 of the NFL season. Not a good look for Randy Gregory. I'm putting Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts on the bench and Nebraska Regent Hal Dobb on the bench. The University of Nebraska linebacker Michael Rose Ivy, along with two of his teammates, decided to take a knee during the playing of the national anthem in a game against Northwestern. M- Rose Ivy went on air later to describe the aftermath that they received. They, um, he was told that they should be shot, they should be lynched, or they should be hung before the playing of the national anthem the following week. But luckily, there were more people who did not share that opinion because in the following week, Michael Rose Ivy got a warm ovation from the crowd during the game, uh, through the pregame, and it actually brought his mother to tears. After the, the initial protest, Governor Pete Ricketts went on the air and said that the protest was disgraceful and disrespectful. And Hal Dobb, who used to be mayor of Omaha in Nebraska, said that they should be kicked off the team and that they should be they should go and protest on someone else's dime. Now I strongly consider benching uh, wrestler Ric Flair, but I'm going to let him slide right now. I'm going to stick to my original <laughs> benching of uh, all the pundits and fans of the Mets who wanted to have Terry Collins fired. Terry Collins has done a, an incredible job keeping this team together with the, um, considering all of the injuries that he had to deal with throughout the season and he has gotten them to the playoffs and I think that he should be applauded for his efforts. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy-saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Let's get to the events in the pipeline. Well, as of this taping, the New York Mets have a one-game playoff against the San Francisco Giants at City Field. If they can win that game, it looks like they're, t- they're going to have a rematch against the Chicago Cubs in the first round of the National League Division Series. Meanwhile, a tough test for Gang Green this weekend as the Jets head to Pittsburgh to take on the Steelers October 9th at Heinz Field. Meanwhile, the New York Giants on that same night will be playing against the Green Bay Packers at Lambeau Field, and that game will be on Sunday night football. Go Giants! And our Brooklyn Nets play tonight against the uh, New York Knicks at Madison Square Garden. They'll be in uh, Miami on Tuesday to play the Heat, and they will return to Barclays Center in another preseason game on Thursday the 13th. Well, we have reached my un. My least favorite point of this, our show, when we have to say goodbye to all of you, our friends out there. But you can always, always keep up with us by following us on Twitter and Instagram, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 4 on one Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald and Vincent Davis, we'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.